Um, God raised up um, Haggai and Zechariah during a, a time when the nation was basically coming back into the land after the 70-year captivity. And they weren't busy re uh, build it, rebuilding the temple that Nebuchadnezzar had destroyed. So these prophets are raised up to provide an encouragement to rebuild temple number two. So the book of Zechariah has four parts. There's an introductory call to repentance. Chapter one, verses one through six. And then what follows are the eight night visions that he received in a single night. Beginning in chapter one, verse seven, all the way through chapter six, verse 15. All of them in some form or substance are basically prophecies giving the, creating the incentive for the nation to rebuild temple number two. And then that's followed chapters seven and eight by a question and answer session where in chapter seven, verses one through three, uh, some people find Zechariah and they want to know, should we continue to mourn the destruction of the first temple now that the second temple is being rebuilt? So they had like a whole mourning ritual that they were going through for 70 years. And their question is, should we keep mourning over the destruction of Temple One that Nebuchadnezzar destroyed when we're on the precipice of rebuilding that temple? And so the question is posed in chapter seven, verses one through three. And then you go to chapter seven, verse four, through the end of chapter eight, and the answer is basically, you should mourn the cause rather than the effect. In other words, rather than mourning the destruction of the temple, you should mourn the reason why God allowed the temple to be destroyed, which was your own sin. So they had basically, they were focused on the consequence of the sin, the destruction of Temple One, rather than the sin itself that led to God needing to discipline the nation. And part of that discipline was the destruction of Temple One. So that covers chapters seven and eight. And then you get to the very end of the book of Zechariah and there's two burdens. Burden number one is in chapters nine through 11 and it deals with Israel's postponed deliverance due to the rejection of her own Messiah. So it's an amazing set of prophecies where Zechariah, 500 years in advance, predicts that the nation of Israel will reject their own Messiah in the first advent. And all of the blessings that God wanted to bring to the nation have now been postponed because the nation would reject um, Israel in her uh, the, Israel rather would reject her Messiah in the first advent. So, you know, that, that lays out 500 years before it happened specific details about the rejection of Christ by Israel, right down to how many pieces of silver Jesus would be betrayed for, etc. And then... Once Zechariah is finished with that burden, he moves into burden number two, which is in chapters 12 through 14, which is basically a prophecy or a prediction that the second time around, Israel is going to get it right. And in the events surrounding the great tribulation period, yet future, Israel will accept nationally the Messiah that was rejected 2,000 years ago. And once that happens, all of these postponed blessings that God had in store for Israel will, in fact, become a reality for the nation of Israel. And so chapter 12 
is a description of this physical and spiritual salvation of Israel. Uh, chapter 13 is really a description of the spiritual cleansing of Israel. And then you move into chapter 14, which is where we are in our study, which is the kingdom, essentially. The kingdom which is going to come to planet Earth once the nation of Israel receives her king. And so chapter 14 is one of the most interesting chapters really in the whole Bible concerning the reality of the coming kingdom to planet Earth. And what's holding it up is Israel is in her state of unbelief currently. Not that individual Jews can't get saved today, they do. But the bulk of the nation, the crux of the nation, remains in unbelief. Um, having just returned from Israel, I can tell you that that's true. Uh, the nation right now is in a state of unbelief. And we were very fortunate where we actually had a believing Israeli tour guide, which is actually very, very rare. Um, I think I've been to Israel about five times and almost every time we've had tour guides that are extremely knowledgeable about the land of Israel. They're actually extremely knowledgeable about Hebrew Bible. They actually know an awful lot about our New Testament, but they're unsaved. And so having an unbelieving Israeli tour guide is sort of what's normal today. And we actually had a believer. So that's a rare exception. Um, because this is what God said would happen. He predicted in burden number one that the nation would reject their king and be in a state of unbelief for a season. Uh, that season has been going on for 2,000 years, but there is a happy ending to it because the nation, the second time around, in the events of the tribulation, will receive her king and once she does that, the blessings that are now in a state of postponement will become a reality for Israel and the whole world as the kingdom comes to the earth. So about three weeks ago or four weeks ago prior to our trip, the trip I took, we studied Zechariah 14 verses 1 through 7, which is a description of Jerusalem's deliverance. When nobody else will stand up for Jerusalem and all the nations of the earth come against Jerusalem, God will fight for her. So I believe, if memory serves, it's Psalm 121, verse 4, which says, He who keeps Israel neither sleeps nor slumbers. And so at the darkest point, Israel will turn to God in faith and God himself will show up and deliver the nation of Israel. He will fight, literally fight, for the nation of Israel when no one else will. So what happens after that? What happens after that is Israel nationally will be in a state of faith or belief and once that happens, the kingdom will come to the earth. And the coming of that kingdom and what the kingdom is going to be like and kingdom conditions is described in Zechariah 14, verses 8 through 11. So one of my professors, uh, Dr. Toussaint, put it this way in class one day. He said, you know, the whole world could get saved. And yet, if tiny Israel remains in unbelief, the kingdom cannot come to planet Earth. Conversely, the whole world could reject Jesus, but if tiny Israel nationally receives him as their Messiah, the kingdom will come to planet Earth. And so you have to understand that the whole kingdom program is riding on, by divine design, Israel's response to her king. So in this second burden, Zechariah is predicting that Israel is going to respond the right way, yet future, and the kingdom is going to come to the earth 
And so what we believe is that the kingdom will not come to the earth until after the second advent. A lot of churches don't teach it this way. They basically believe we're in the kingdom now. They host conferences about kingdom builders as if we are advancing the kingdom, building the kingdom somehow. Um, our perspective at Sugarland Bible Church is different than that. We are basically what are called pre-millennialists. And what that means is the second coming takes place first or pre before the millennium or thousand year kingdom. So it's, it's exactly what, I mean, basically what we believe is portrayed in this chart. Following the rapture, there's a seven year tribulation in which the nation of Israel will be saved physically and spiritually. Uh, it's going to take a, a, a trial of that magnitude and bring them to faith. And don't look down on them, because look at what God had to do in your life, <laughs> in my life, to bring us to faith. Uh, most people come to Christ through great tribulation, because God has to sort of remove from us all of the comforts that we think we can count on. Um, and we come to Christ knowing he's our only hope. And it's the same with the nation of Israel. They've got to go through this time period uh, to recognize that they need a Messiah. And in fact, their Messiah came 2,000 years ago. And they've been in a state of rejection of him ever since. It's going to take the seven-year tribulation period to bring that about. But once it happens and Israel is in faith, as God has promised the thousand-year kingdom will manifest itself on planet Earth. So, teaching about the kingdom is one thing. What we're teaching here is the timing of the kingdom. Some of the greatest uh, debates in the Bible take place around not the what question, but the when question. The rapture. The um, rapture. We can talk about what it is, but the real debate is when does it happen? Pre, mid, post. That's a when question discussion. This discussion about the kingdom, you know, are you amillennial, postmillennial, premillennial, amillennial, postmillennial, put the kingdom before Jesus comes back? We're not doing that. We're placing the kingdom after Jesus comes back at the end of the tribulation period, that's taking a stand not on the what question, but the when question. So we believe that the things that are described here in Zechariah 14 will not come to the earth until Jesus comes back to this earth. And he's not coming back to this earth. I'm not speaking here of the rapture. I'm speaking of the second advent. Second Advent is not going to happen until Israel, Matthew 23, verses 37 through 39, calls on Jesus to come and rescue them. And that can't happen until they're in faith. So, tribulation, Second Advent. We saw back in verse 5 a description of the Second Advent in verse 4. His feet are going to touch the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives is going to split. Um, Job, the oldest book of the Bible, says, I know that my Redeemer lives. Job 19, I think it is, around verses 23 and 24, if memory serves. I know that my Redeemer lives because the, in the end, he will take his stand on the earth. Jesus is coming back to planet earth to rescue Israel who at that point will be in faith. And only when that event happens and his feet touch down on planet Earth at the end of the tribulation period can you expect the unfolding or the subsequent earthly kingdom, sometimes called the millennium. So once the kingdom comes, what's it going to be like? Well, as you look at verses 8 through 11... You have a description of Jerusalem's waters, verse 8. 
Christ's earthly reign, verse 9, profound changes in the topography of this world, verse 10, and you can expect Jesus to rule and reign planet earth for a thousand years from Jerusalem, verse 11. So that's kind of an outline for verses 8 through 11. And so let's start here with Jerusalem's waters. Zechariah 14 and verse 8 says, In that day, now what day would that be? That would be the day where Jesus comes back. In that day, living waters will flow out of Jerusalem. Half of them towards the eastern sea and the other half towards the western sea. It will be in summer as well as in winter. So you notice that it mentions here the western sea and it mentions the eastern sea. Well, what is the western sea? It's the Mediterranean west of the nation of Israel. Well, what would the eastern sea be? The eastern sea is the Dead Sea, uh, east of the nation of Israel. So you see how literal this is. This is not some kind of, you know, nebulous cloud talk about Jesus reigning in our hearts. I mean, these are actually talking about specific bodies of water. And I would correlate this with Ezekiel 47, verses 1 through 12, which says, In the kingdom age there will be a temple again. This will be temple number 4. And there's actually going to be water that's going to flow out of that temple. And it's going to flow from Jerusalem into the Dead Sea. And the Dead Sea will, at that point, no longer be dead because it will teem with biological life. So there's kind of an artist's rendition uh, based on Ezekiel 40 through 48 of what we would call the Millennial Temple. Zechariah is going to make reference to the Millennial Temple. He's just going to call it the House of the Lord. And there's the Dead Sea. And why do we call the Dead Sea the Dead Sea? Because everything in the sea is dead. In fact, you can go to the Dead Sea today and you could actually float in the Dead Sea because the salt content buoys you right up. I can promise you that it works. I was convinced, there was my wife and myself a couple years back floating in the Dead Sea. Um, the only thing that's troubling is you have some kind of cut and it can sting a lot. But other than that, it's a lot of fun. Uh, I was convinced I would be the first person to sink, but I didn't sink and we were buoyed up quite well. Here's other pictures of people floating in the Dead Sea. And what Ezekiel 47 is talking about is such a profound change of topography that even the Dead Sea, because this high salt content just kills, you know, the, the, the biological life, the sea life, um, even that itself is going to be reversed. And I'm not making this up. It's, it's right there in your Bible. Ezekiel 47, verses 1 through 12 says it. And so you have a decision as a Bible interpreter. You can either take the Bible for what it says or, or come up with some kind of an excuse as to why it really doesn't mean what it says. You know, I've heard pastors talk about this and, and try to analogize it or say this is really a prophecy about the lost sinner that trusts Christ and is born again. And, well, of course, we want lost sinners to trust Christ and be born again, but Ezekiel 47 isn't talking about that. He's talking about physical changes to this world, right down to the Dead Sea when Jesus returns. And did you catch the geography correctly? Um, it calls the Dead Sea the Eastern Sea, and it calls the Mediterranean Sea the Western Sea. Now that's pretty significant. Um, here is Jerusalem, and then you have West, Mediterranean, and then you have East, the Dead Sea. So as far as God is concerned, the Dead Sea is in the East, not the West. 
Why is that a big deal? Because there's a chunk of real estate that the world community thinks if Israel just relinquishes this, peace would break out all over the Middle East. Uh, it's a dispute of a territory that they call the West Bank. Well, that's interesting. Why is it called the West Bank when God says it's in the East? See that? Well, when you use the expression West Bank, you're using a Jordanian mindset. Because that land is west of Jordan, but as far as God's geography is concerned, that's not the West Bank at all. That's in the east. And in fact, the expression West Bank, you'll not find it a single time in the Bible. The Bible calls that territory Judea and Samaria. So I find this very interesting because we use this expression West Bank all of the time, and we're actually buying into the Jordanian narrative, the Palestinian narrative, when we use that expression, because that real estate is west of Jordan. But God says the Dead Sea is not in the west, it's in the east. Mediterranean is in the west. The Dead Sea, you know, is in the, in the east. So biblically speaking, we don't like to use, I don't like to use it, I don't think we as Christians should use it. You know, I used that expression for years and years without really understanding what I was saying. But words mean things. I mean, every time you use the expression West Bank, you're taking an anti-Israel perspective. And you're using vocabulary that fits the Palestinian narrative and the Jordanian perspective. Now, you know, it's, it's just a matter of looking at verse 8 and seeing what's in the east and what's in the west. West, Mediterranean Sea, east, uh, Dead Sea. So I think it's high time we started using vocabulary that's consistent with God's revelation. Can I get an amen on that? I prefer to use the expression Samar Judea and Samaria. I'm not going to buy into a globalist understanding of where they think the West or the East is. You know, I want to follow what God says. And so you'll notice that this, these waters are going to flow from Jerusalem, East and West. And when you track the Eastern trajectory of these waters, they're going to go into the Dead Sea, which is not in the West, according to God. It's in the East, and the Dead Sea itself will come back to life. And how long are these waters going to flow for? It's at the end of verse 8. It will be summer as well as in winter. So during the thousand-year reign of Christ, these waters are going to flow right out of the temple around the clock, right on through the calendar. It's describing here a consistent flow of water from the rebuilt temple number four into those two into those two seas. So that's a that's a profound topographical change. And we move away from Jerusalem's waters to Christ's earthly reign, and you'll notice it right there in verse nine. The Lord will, future tense, you see that? The Lord will be king over all the earth. So Jesus functioning as king is future, according to Zechariah's prophecy. Jesus has three offices, prophet, priest, and king. And he exercises authority in those offices at different times times in his ministry. He functioned as prophet in his first coming because he was doing like the prophets of old did, calling Israel back to God's covenant. He today is functioning as high priest at the right hand of the father after the order of Melchizedek. And he's been functioning in that role ever since the ascension. And if you want a good book that describes this, 
and tries to prove this in great detail, I recommend the book of Hebrews, because that's really the whole point of the book of Hebrews. That Christ is now in his present session at the Father's right hand, exercising his role as high priest. And his priesthood is higher than Aaron's. He's not just a run-of-the-mill Levitical priest. He is brought in a superior priesthood. Uh, if Jesus was just another priest after Aaron's line, he would have been born through which tribe? Levi, but he was not born through the tribe of Levi. He was born through the tribe of Judah. And so, obviously, he's not just another Levitical, Aaronic priest, but he is functioning as priest. He is functioning as priest at the Father's right hand, and he's doing a ton of stuff. Um, he's giving the church spiritual gifts. He's building the church. When people trust in Christ for salvation, he is baptizing or identifying them with Christ's body, the church. Um, he's actually the one that's keeping, according to the book of Colossians, our world in its proper orbit, preventing the planets from colliding with each other. He is sustaining our universe. Uh, the very molecules in our body are being sustained and being held together. And he's doing all of these things at the Father's right hand, functioning as high priest. He's forgiving sins. When we as God's people sin against God, it doesn't change our position, but it can change our fellowship. 1 John 1 verse 9 says we have provision for that issue. And these are all the outworkings of what we would call Christ's present session in heaven. At the Father's right hand, functioning as high priest, he's not even sitting on David's throne right now. And this is a big problem um, with... Uh, a lot of the things that are happening in modern day scholarship, you know, my, my alma mater, Dallas Theological Seminary, the younger professors are all wrapped up in this mindset that Jesus is sitting on David's throne right now in heaven. No, David's throne is on the earth. Jesus is not on David's throne right now. Revelation 3 verse 21 says he is on the Father's throne. At the Father's right hand. He is not functioning in his regal sense right now. He is not functioning as king. If, if he was functioning as king right now, then why is Satan still the ruler of this world? And he's not doing too good a job as a king. Um, and he will continue to function as high priest in his present session until the day in history comes... When the nation of Israel, in faith, calls him back to the earth, at that point he will leave heaven and his feet will touch planet earth and he will function as king in his regal authority in his second advent. And Satan will be a non-factor once that happens. The book of Revelation chapter 20 verses 2 and 3 tells us that Satan is going to be bound in the abyss for a thousand years. And actual true justice will come to planet Earth. And that doesn't happen until he's functioning as king. And what people are doing very sadly is they're merging those two offices and trying to make it look like, you know, we're sort of in a kingdom now in some sense. And the Bible knows no such teaching. I mean, I know this ruins a lot of worship songs about King Jesus this and King Jesus that. And I, I agree with them in the sense that he will be king one day. But he is not functioning as king presently. He is functioning as high priest at the Father's right hand after the order of Melchizedek. And he'll continue in that role, a vital role, until the conversion of Israel. And they call him back to the earth. And his feet touch the Mount of Olives. And he'll take his seat in Jerusalem on David's throne and administer this world in perfection uh, for a thousand years. Until that happens, nobody can say he's functioning as king now. Or the kingdom has come to planet Earth. And only by moving into a non-literal, allegorical interpretation of the Bible can you start to confuse those offices. So prophet, priest, and king. And we have to keep these separate 
and we have to keep these straight or we're going to end up being confused. That's why Zechariah says, and the Lord will be king. It's not happening now. It's yet future. And by the way, when he exercises his authority as king, what's he going to be king of? It's right there in verse 9, over all the earth. This is an earthly kingdom. This is the restoration of planet earth from what Satan stole um, in Genesis chapter 3. This is not heaven. The reason we know it's not heaven is it says earth. Is that in your Bible? It says it right there, verse 9. And the Lord will be king over all the earth. Now, one of the things that people do is they try to... I don't know what it is with people. They, they, they want some kind of escape from this doctrine of the millennial kingdom. And they try to kind of yank all of this stuff into the far right-hand side of the screen. They say, you know, this is not describing an earthly kingdom of a thousand years. This is just talking about the eternal state, which is described in Revelation 21 and 22. Well, I, I agree with Arnold Fruchtenbaum that the Old Testament prophets, for the most part, could not see the eternal state. The, the high point of their revelation, as the Holy Spirit was inspiring them to write, the high point of their revelation was the earthly kingdom. And you don't get descriptions of the eternal state until you get to the New Testament it starts to get revealed a little bit in Galatians 4. And it starts to get revealed a little bit more in 2 Peter chapter 3. And then finally you get the full revelation of the eternal state in Revelation 21 and 22. And that's going to be a wonderful time period as well. But that time period will not manifest itself until the thousand year kingdom subsequent to the physical return of Christ, runs its course. And that's what all of these prophets, Zechariah and the rest of them, that's what they could see. They're not focused here on the eternal state. They're focused on the, what the book of Revelation calls the thousand-year kingdom, which will precede the eternal state. Now, how, how do I know that? <clears throat> because the eternal state, it's very clear on the things that will be there and the things that won't be there. And there's all the scripture verses in parenthesis if you wanted to take the time to look these up. But there won't in the eternal state, there'll be no Satan, no sea, no death, crying, or pain, no sun, no moon, no temple, no night, no evil, and no curse. Now, right away, you can look at Zechariah 14 and you could say, well, this is not describing the eternal state. First of all, number two, no sea. Didn't we just read about two seas in verse 8? An eastern sea and a western sea? So that's a very odd description of the eternal state. And the reason being is it's not a description of the eternal state, but people are trying to for whatever reason, turn this into the eternal state. Number six there, there won't be a temple. Well, we just got finished talking about how there's going to be a temple, Ezekiel 47, in Jerusalem, and from that temple is going to flow waters into the Western Sea and into the Eastern Sea, and the Eastern Sea will teem with biological life. So there's another difference there. And also when you look at Revelation 21, verse 4 of the eternal state, it says he will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning. There will no longer be any crying or pain for the first order of things has passed away. There won't be rebellion against God or sin against God ever in the eternal state forever. Well, Zechariah 14 can't be talking about that. Because when you look at Zechariah 14, 16 through 18, just reading ahead a little bit, 
It says, then it will come about that any who are left of all the nations that went against Jerusalem will go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to celebrate the Feast of Booths. Now, as we get into these verses, don't worry, we're going to unpack all of this. But for the time being, notice the rebellion. It says, and it will be that whichever of the families of the earth does not go up to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, there will be no rain on them. So if you do not accept the reign of Jesus in the millennial kingdom, then you get no physical reign for your crops. And notice that there are people that that just get rebellious. They don't want to go worship Jesus on Mount Zion. So it's describing here rebellion. That cannot be a description of the eternal state. Because in the eternal state, there's no more rebellion at all. This is obviously talking about some transitional period of time before the eternal state comes into existence. And then he, he starts to talk about Egypt. If the family of the Egypt does not go up to enter, then no rain will fall on them. It will be the plague with which the Lord smites the nations who do not go up to celebrate the Feast of Booths. So there are going to be rebels in the millennial kingdom. Where do these rebels come from? They are the ones who survived the tribulation period. They were believers. They went into the millennial kingdom in non-resurrected, non-glorified bodies. They had children. Their children had children. The earth was repopulated, but what just got passed down through the bloodline? The sin nature. The sin nature is still there. Now, it won't be present among us because we will be in resurrected bodies. We receive our resurrected body at the point of the rapture. There will also be people who receive their resurrected bodies, Old Testament saints, and tribulation martyrs at the beginning of the millennial kingdom. So everybody in a resurrected body will be ruling and reigning with Christ. Who are we ruling and reigning over? We're reigning over these mortals who still have a sin nature. This is why Jesus in the millennial kingdom has to exercise authority with a rod of iron. The rod of iron is necessary to keep in check The rebels, who are the rebels? The rebels are the descendants of those that survived the tribulation and entered the millennial kingdom in non-resurrected bodies. So you actually, in the millennial kingdom, are going to have two groups of people. Resurrected people and non-resurrected people. And there actually is a parallel following Christ's resurrection Acts chapter 1, leading up to his ascension, there's a 40-day period where he's in his resurrected body. And he's interacting with the disciples who are in non-resurrected bodies. Thomas is touching his wounds, you'll remember, hands and feet. They're having meals together. He'll say stuff like, come, let's have breakfast and you know, that kind of thing. They're asking him questions. You know, at this time, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? So they're having kind of a theological conversation back and forth. And that whole 40-day period is happening with a resurrected man, Jesus, in a resurrected body, speaking to non-resurrected people. And if you can envision that for 40 days, that is sort of the reality that's going to take place for a thousand years where you have these two categories of people. This is why these people here need to be subjugated. They need to be brought under the authority and rulership of Jesus. They have to be almost scared to step out of line. The the age of grace here, folks, is over when we get to this time in history. Uh, Jesus is ruling with a rod of iron. People, for the most part, aren't going to want to step out of line. 
And if they do, just like that, they don't receive rain for their crops. You know, there's some sort of immediate punishment. And so this is the kind of thing that's happening throughout the thousand years. And that doesn't even, what I've tried to describe here, does not fit anything related to the eternal state. For everyone will be in a resurrected body by that time. And those in the eternal state will have no propensity whatsoever to go back to the sin nature. Because the sin nature doesn't exist in a resurrected body. So I go on and on about this a little bit because it just bothers me how people are so cavalier with the Bible and flippant that they just want to take all this stuff and dodge the millennium and just kind of toss it into the you know, far right hand corner there. And just make this the eternal state. You can't do that with God's word. God's word has details in it that do not fit the eternal state. This is talking about an intermediate time period in between the second advent and when the eternal state happens that will go on for a thousand years called the, called the millennial reign of Christ. And you'll notice uh, the expression there in verse 9, in that day. I mean, when is this going to happen? In the day that Israel nationally acknowledges Jesus. That's the day he'll come back to the earth. His high priestly ministry will be over. He will be ruling with regal authority from David's throne. And we're not to expect that time period to come until you have a converted Israel, which we don't have right now. So all of these blessings are now in a state of not cancellation, but postponement. And in the interim, he's doing some wonderful things for us. At the Father's right hand, functioning as high priest. But don't confuse it with what's being spoken of here. The regal authority of Jesus Christ. And when this time period comes, Jesus will function as absolute monarch. No opinion polls, uh, no politicians going out and sampling the voters. You know, you don't have to stay up till three o'clock in the morning watching cable news to figure out if the election was stolen or whatever. I mean, all of that's done. You're, you're talking about an absolute monarch, and you see that right there at the end of verse um, nine. The Lord will be the only one. And his name, the only one. No one will challenge his authority, not even the devil. Because the devil will be placed in incarceration, in the abyss. The book of Revelation says. So people ask me, well, gee, Andy, are you Republican? Are you Democrat? Are you Libertarian? Are you Green Party? What exactly are you? Well, really, what I am is a monarchist. I am an absolute total monarchist. I want a monarchy. But I don't want a monarchy till we have the right monarch. I want a person without a sin nature to govern this world in perfection. That's what I want. And that's why we pray, thy kingdom come. But be careful about praying that one too. Because once the kingdom comes, the age of grace is finished. All of this patience of God, long-suffering of God forbearance of God, and thank God for all of that. That's all done. You're seeing Jesus face to face. He's ruling with a rod of iron. And the rebels that think about stepping out of line are too afraid to do so. That's what's going on in the thousand years. And you, as a Christian, are in your resurrected body. And you're governing under his delegated authority. And the type of authority you wield in the kingdom age is contingent upon your faithfulness to him right now. The Bible says if you're faithful with the little things, you can be what? Trusted with many things. You know, the parable of the minas at the end of it. One guy rules over, what was it, five cities. One guy rules over ten. I mean, why does one guy get five and the other guy gets ten? It has to do with are we being faithful to Jesus now in the church age? I'm not talking about eternal security and all that stuff. What I'm talking about is as Christians, we have the opportunity to go back to the sin nature at will, 
Do you guys agree with me on that? I didn't hear anybody too loud on that one. But it's true. I mean, I, I can go out tonight and I can send up a storm. The, the, and why would it matter? I'm, I'm once saved, always saved, right? Well, it does matter. Because it will relate to the type of authority that I will wield or not wield in the millennial kingdom. I mean, this, um, this is the basis of Paul's injunction to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2, around verses 17 and 18, actually 11 through 13. Verse 12, he says, if we endure with him, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. Deny us what? Salvation? No. He will deny us opportunities for authority. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. In other words, the promise of eternal securities is in stone. It's in cement. But the degree of authority that you will wield in the millennial age and I will wield in the millennial age is now, right now, being decided. And it's being decided largely based on our faithfulness to Jesus now. That is the whole mindset in Paul's instruction to Timothy. Timothy is thinking of quitting and leaving the ministry. And Paul writes to him and says, you better think twice about that. Your salvation is secure, but there are millennial issues at stake. If we endure, we will reign with him. But if we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. So this is... Um, this type of moral instruction, I think, is one of the reasons why Satan has worked so hard to erase the doctrine of the millennial kingdom from the thinking of most Christians. In fact, most Christians, I would venture to say, have never heard hardly any pastor talk about this kind of stuff that I'm talking about here. And that's by satanic design. Satan doesn't want you to think about this time period because he knows if you think about too much about this time period... It's going to positively impact choices and decisions that we're making today. So in that day, there will be an absolute monarchy on planet Earth. So you have a description of Jerusalem's waters. You have a description of Christ's earthly reign. And then you have a description of the changing topography of the Earth. It says all the land will be changed into a plain from Giba to Ramon, south of Jerusalem. There are lots of topographical changes that are coming. The rainfall is going to increase. Ezekiel 34, verses 26 and 27. There's going to be water in the desert. Water where it doesn't exist right now. Isaiah 35, verses 6 and 7. As I tried to explain earlier, the Dead Sea itself is going to come back to life. Ezekiel 47, verses 1 through 12. The sun, not the S-O-N sun, the S-U-N sun, is going to be seven times brighter than its current rate. That's in Isaiah 30, verse 26. And physical healing will come to all, the whole planet. Whatever disease or ailment people are struggling with immediately is taken care of once the millennial age comes. Isaiah chapter 35, uh, verses 5 and 6. And so among these topographical changes, it says all the land, so this isn't heaven or anything like that, it's earthly, all the land will be changed into a plain from Giba to Ramon, um, south of Jerusalem. Now, what's going to happen to the city of Jerusalem? Glad you asked. What does it say here? But Jerusalem will rise. Why does it say Jerusalem will rise? Because Jerusalem, the city itself, is going to be 
the centerpiece of the millennial kingdom. The nations of the earth will go to Jerusalem on the Feast of Booths to worship the king, which means Jerusalem, contrary to how the world looks at it today, just a little city in the way of progress, Jerusalem is going to be the cat's meow. I mean, it's actually going to be physic. It's going to actually physically, topographically, geographically risen to a place of preeminence over the other nations. Physically, I'm talking about. You see this described in the book of Isaiah, chapter two, verses one through four. It says, "The Lord, the word which Isaiah the son of Amos saw." concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Now it will come about in the last days that the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains and will be raised above the hills. And all the nations will stream to it and many people will come and say, come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord to the house of God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For the law will go forth from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations. He will render decisions for many peoples. They will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks Nation will not lift up sword against nation, and never again will they learn of war. War's over. The word of God is coming from the city of Jerusalem, not Washington, D.C. And consequently, in preparation for this, the topography of the earth has changed to the point where Jerusalem is, is somehow risen above the hills, above the nations. Everybody knows where it is. Everybody can see it. And the nations of the earth will stream to, uh, to Jerusalem. But as you continue to look at verse 10, it gives even more details here. It talks about Jerusalem rising, but then it says in verse 10, and remain on its site from Benjamin's gate as far as the place of the first gate to the corner gate from the tower of Hananel to the king's wine presses. So it's risen in one sense, but a lot of it is kept the same. Uh, there's a description of Jerusalem in Nehemiah's day. Uh, you'll recognize some of the different gates that are mentioned in this prophecy. Uh, you'll, you'll notice the king's wine press. You'll notice the tower of Hanel, Hananel, if I'm pronouncing that right. And this is what Charles Ryrie says about this verse. First of all, Geba, six miles northeast of Jerusalem. Ramon, 35 miles southwest of Jerusalem. And then he mentions Benjamin's gate was in the northern wall of Jerusalem. The first gate at the northeast corner, the corner gate at the northwest corner, the tower of Hananel at the northern corner, the king's wine presses, I think you can probably see them here, the king's wine presses at the south end. And so when you go to Jerusalem today, you know, the, the tour guides will point out the various corners of the old city of Jerusalem, right down to Stephen's gate, which was the gate where Stephen Acts chapter 7 was stoned to death. And so, yes, Jerusalem is, is sort of being risen up, but a lot of the dimensions of the city of Jerusalem that we know about going all the way back to Nehemiah chapter 2 seem to be still intact. And nobody would look at these figures, Benjamin's Gate, Tower of Hanel, King's Wine Presses, and somehow argue, well, this is not literal stuff. I mean, nobody in any part of the Bible would ever do that. But, but they all feel that they can do it because it's Bible prophecy. They feel that the text doesn't say what it means. 
But I'm here to tell you that Bible prophecy is not to be interpreted that way. It means what it says, and it says what it means, whether I like it or not, or whether I understand it or not. And if there's some kind of ambiguity about it, it's probably coming from the recesses of my dark imagination. And it's not coming from God's Word. Because I think God's Word on these kinds of subjects is like crystal clear. It's like you either accept what it says, or you try to, you know, superimpose some kind of pre-understanding, you know, over the text. So this is going to be uh, something else. Let's just put it that way. You think we can make it through verse 11 tonight? I'm going to try to make it through verse 11. I guess you guys don't have to. You can get up, get up and leave whenever you want. Uh, let's look real fast, verse 11, at the millennial Jerusalem. It says, people will live in it. Hey, the city of Jerusalem is going to be repopulated. Now, didn't Zechariah predict that earlier? Notice Zechariah 8, 4, and 5. It gives a prophecy about the city of Jerusalem being repopulated. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Old men and old women shall sit in the streets of Jerusalem, each one with his staff in his hand because of his great age. The streets of the city shall be full of boys and girls playing in its streets. So Zechariah already predicted the city would be repopulated. And here that's uh, being reemphasized at the beginning of verse, um, verse 11. In fact, the whole world's going to be repopulated. The descendants of those who survived the tribulation period will have children. Their children will have children. The earth will be repopulated. That's why the rebellion at the end, the number of those involved in the rebellion, is like the sand of the seashore. You're dealing with not just a repopulated city. You're dealing with a repopulated planet. Jerusalem, as we've talked about, is very, very different than the eternal state. In the millennium, sin is restrained. In the eternal state, it's removed. In the millennium, the curse is restrained. In the eternal state, it's removed. In the millennium, there's death. No death in the eternal state. In the millennium, mortals and resurrected people will dwell together in the eternal state, resurrected people only. In the millennium, you still have to evangelize because there'll be unbelievers that need to know Christ. Evangelism will be unnecessary in the eternal state. The millennium is a renovation. The eternal state is a brand new creation. The millennium is temporary. It lasts only a thousand years. The eternal state lasts forever. The millennium is transitional. The eternal state is non-transitional. In the millennium, there's time, a thousand years. The eternal state lasts forever. In that sense, it's timeless. In the, eternal, in the millennium, there's luminaries, sun, moon, and stars. In the eternal state, there are no luminaries. In the millennium, there's a temple. There is no temple in the eternal state. In the millennium, there's death. There is no death in the eternal state. In the millennium, there's satanic activity where Satan is going to be unleashed at the end. That won't be an issue in the, etern in the eternal state. In the millennium, there'll be rebellion. But in the eternal state, there'll be no more rebellion. Uh, you continue on in verse 11, and it says, And there will no longer be a curse. The curse is substantially rolled back in the millennial kingdom. And it goes on and it says in verse 11, for Jerusalem will dwell in security. That's a big deal because today the city of Jerusalem does not dwell in security. That little red dot is Israel. Those green, that green area there is Islamic nations, theocracies threatening to drive Israel into the sea. 
And the world community today says, well, Israel just needs to give up a little bit more territory and we'll have peace. Um, she has no security today. But she gets that in the millennial kingdom. Now, the Antichrist, the first two seals, will give her temporary peace. That's what Ezekiel 38 verse 8 is talking about when it says they'll be living securely at the time of this invasion and at rest. But that security that the Antichrist rolls out for unbelieving Israel will be short-lived because the advent of the Antichrist is followed by war. Revelation 6 verses 3 and 4. So what, what only God can give, security to the nation. The nation of Israel is seeking today without Jesus. And there will come a man, the Antichrist, who will give them a season of security. It will be short-lived. As you know from Bible prophecy, he will double-cross the nation of Israel. And her short-lived security will disappear but when Jesus returns to the earth and rules the nations of the earth for a thousand years, according to verse 11, finally Jerusalem will have what she's always wanted, that she's always sought in the wrong source. This time she will seek it in Jesus Christ and he will bring uh, permanent security uh, to the nation of Israel. So those are some amazing conditions, aren't they? Well, what's going to happen to the nations that have come against Israel? We'll see that next time. And what um, is worship going to be like in the kingdom age? Um, we'll see that next time as well. So it's 8.03, and if you have to take off or collect your kids, um, feel free to do that. And if anybody wants to stick around for Q&A, we can do that as well.